Arizona State. Right. I'm a Sun Devil, man. State of the Sun Devils with Jeremy Schnell, Jesse Morrison, and Mitch Bereldis, an Arizona sports podcast. Hello and welcome into another edition of State of the Sun Devils alongside Jesse Morrison and Mitch Fereldis. I'm Jeremy Schnell. Tough loss for ASU today or tomorrow or yesterday. What day is it, guys? No, 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 stop. Let's just keep it simple. We're recording this right (laughs) after ASU just lost to Oregon. So it is Thursday night. So when you're listening to this, maybe it's Friday morning. Maybe you're super night owl and it's still Thursday night. Maybe it's Saturday. Who knows? But, yeah. 80, not great. 80, not great. 80 to 61. Um, I, I, let's just start with that 15 to 2 run over six minutes. minutes. Which one? I felt like there were three 15 to 2 runs in this game. Well, ASU had one. <laughs> they look. That's just, that's just it. It's, and I know, Jesse, I want to hear your thoughts on it too, but they looked so good in the first half early on when they were yeah. able to get those fast break opportunities. They were preventing Oregon from getting second chances. And... Then it just completely disappeared in the second half. I don't know what happened. Yeah, when this game started, Oregon put out some giant dudes in the post, and they weren't getting any offensive rebounds. ASU ended up going up 20-10 to 10 at one point in the first half, and then the second half, just Oregon lit up the gym. It was just a insane offensive performance from the Ducks in the second half, and ASU... Just went cold, and so I don't really know. This is just a bad. This is a bad loss because they needed. They need wins like this again. Watching this game made me think. Oof. Pac-12 men's <laughs> basketball this season, not good. Like no. I, I hate. I hate to break it to ASU fans. I hate to break it to Oregon fans. But neither of these two teams that we watched play tonight are. In my opinion, like top half teams in some conferences. Yeah, and you look at the stats in this game. Let's start with three point shooting. ASU were four for 17, that's 23%. And then uh, Oregon kind of got hot toward the end of the game yeah. and made. Oh, they were making like every three yeah, in the second half. But it, it, you look at the numbers, they only had nine three pointers, guys. Yeah. And I, I'm just, I'm looking at those three pointers and I'm like, that's part of the difference and then you look at the free throws uh 15 made free throws for oregon they shot 16 free throws asu shot 11 they were seven for 11 asu struggled from the free throw line much of this season um i just think that those were two places that asu kind of lost this game because they were getting so much and so many different opportunities from inside the three-point arc, which, to Jesse's point, is kind of interesting because Oregon was a much bigger team, like, lineup-wise. There was even, <laughs> I remember Kyle Dodd was talking about it on the uh, the radio call, and he had said that at one point there was Bryant Celebonge, Alonzo Gaffney, Sean Phillips, and Kamari Lance all on the floor at the same time. That's four dudes at 6'10 plus. So you know that they were trying to game plan against it. And for the most part, it was working. Ironically, when they had their smaller lineups, I, I just, why this team can't play consistently from one half to the next or replicate that success that they had playing one half to the next against USC, for example, like that team was awesome. This team, they had a method and then all of a sudden it just kind of crumbled from underneath them. Very reminiscent of the Washington loss a couple of weeks ago. Jesse, they it, you kind of want them to struggle in the first half because it's like there's one half of each game that they struggle and then the other half it's like, oh, they're really good. And you saw it in the first half. They looked really good at, at yeah. points. I mean, this is something that Charlie Turner Thorne used to talk about when she coached ASU um, is that it's tough in college for college athletes to put together a full 40 minutes. They're not professionals. Um, yes, they're getting paid a little bit now, but again, they're not professionals. It's a collection of college students playing basketball. Um, so again, it, it's hard to put together a full 40 minutes. So to your point, Jeremy, again, I would love to see it in the second half versus the first half because again if, if you're gonna choose which half that you want to be better in you want to have it be down the stretch and I, I hate even bringing up this argument in this conversation but i'm totally on charlie's side here that like it's just not 
you're just not going to see a college team put together 40 full minutes. And Oregon didn't put together 40 full minutes. They were terrible to start the game. So, it, you know, it, it's it's just one of those things where you want the momentum late in the game or else it's going to be bad. That's why we see so many upsets is these teams take the momentum late in the game in college and then, you know, your fans are storming the court. You saw it in the first half a little bit. Uh, Frankie Collins was kind of going to the rack a little bit. And I, I really enjoy it when he creates off the dribble. He can get fouled and get to the line. Not a great free throw shooter. He's shown more this year being able to shoot the free throws. But my point being, he's able to get to the rim and get buckets. He was settling, it seemed like, toward the end of the first half and toward the end of the game. I want to see more playmaking ability from Frankie Collins. Today was one of his worst games of the season. He shot, um, let's see, he shot 4 of 13 from the field and had 8 points and 3 turnovers. He had 2 steals again. He's on pace for for a hundred about 100 steals this year. That's though, what Mitch. I was going to get at. It's like, yes, Frankie struggled offensively and it's very evident in the statistics, but he was still very active defensively early on. Like, as I'm listening to Tim and Kyle talk about it, he was still getting in the faces of the Oregon players, still creating turnover opportunities, still creating fast break opportunities. And even Jemiah Neal said it after the USC win that defense is offense for them. Once they get themselves into fast break and that very fast momentum, this team's offense is very difficult to stop. The problem is they had very few opportunities where they were able to do that. So once you get stuck in that half-court offensive mode, we start to see the issues that we've pinpointed with this offense all year long. Yeah, way too much half-court offense in the game uh, tonight. And then I would just like to kind of just talk about the starting lineup statistics in general. Really, the only starter that played well in this game was Jose Perez. Mm -hmm. And even I have some issues with his game because (laughs) he had two rebounds and he's kind of plays like a post and he he should get more rebounds than that and also on offense this dude makes so many three-pointers when he takes them why is he only taking two three-pointers he made two of the team's four the rest of the team was two of 15 take more threes jose he's really good at it i just i i don't know why he he just goes always for this you know, down low thing. Three is greater than two, and he's obviously one of the best shooters on the team, if not the best one. So that's just confusing to me. And then Jemiah Neal as well. Why only three shots? Why did Alonzo Gaffney take eight shots in this game? And Jemiah <laughs> Neal took three. Like it's just a just an odd box score. Adam Miller with seven total total shots. Yeah, it wasn't his night. You could tell that, but you can try to get going more, you know, take some more shots. Shooters shoot, keep shooting, let him keep shooting. It was just just a weird box score from the the starters as a whole. And, you know, again, they started out rebounding well, but ended up getting out rebounded 35 to 27. No players were in double digits. Well, Jemiah was inhaling basketball yeah, rebounds early on. But they had two offensive rebounds in this entire game. This was not a night for a second chance yeah, opportunities well, like, for yeah, either, e- team. either team. But you'd like to see them get some second chance opportunities. It would be it would be good. You know, and, and I would like to shout out the bench. Kamari Lands played pretty well. Sean Phillips played okay. I would like him to go up stronger with the basketball a couple more times. There was two opportunities that he had to get a dunk. One was blocked. One time he brought the ball down and got fouled instead of just going up and taking the layup. I'd like to see Sean Phillips be more stronger with the ball. Credit to Dana Altman, though. That, like, that team was down and out early in the first half, mm-hmm. and he changed their defensive intensity. Um, it they lo- were the ones playing press a lot in and, the second half. And it looked like just uh, Jesse, to your point, they were making Gaffney shoot, right? And 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 Neil only took three shots. Frankie took thirteen shots. They'll let Frankie take those long three step back three pointers every day of the week. Um, and I think their defensive game plan was perfect against ASU today. And it just ASU is not going to win if they force nine turnovers in a game. I think we've pretty much figured out that out that, that they're just not going. to gonna win if they only force nine turnovers and you know 
Here's the thing about this team. I think that we've we've just kind of started got to start being realistic about this in IT. But at the same time, we talked about at the very beginning that this is not a very competitive conference. This is a rather weak Pac-12. There's one that stands out above the rest of this entire conference, and that's they're Arizona. not that good. But they still stand out above the rest. Sure, but like I've. They've been upset multiple times now. Okay, but they're still the one that's getting the national recognition, and they're playing against a much weaker Oregon State team right now. Yep. And if they win this game, they're tied for first place in the conference with Oregon. They're not that far out of it. Like, Arizona is probably going to run away with this conference, but ASU is playing well enough that they might actually be the sneaky contender to win the conference this year. If they but can... if they play like that, they won't be the sneaky contender. Yeah, if they can get on a heater and win the conference tournament then sure maybe they'll go to you know the first four again uh their second <laughs> they love dayton man their secondary home in dayton <laughs> but i i just don't see that happening they're too inconsistent this season i i think we've really start start uh they we've really got to start thinking about the nit which and i like to say this about the nit it's a really cool opportunity for your program because the games are going to be at desert financial arena probably at least a few of them Mm -hmm. um if asu you know maintains a decent record and gets a pretty good seed and and you know they've got a much better chance of winning the nit than they do the ncaa tournament so i think that there's there's pros and cons to going to the nit um but I think you know that's still that's still further down the road. They could get on a heater in the Pac-12 tournament and win. But they 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 need to beat U of A probably twice now, in my opinion, to get to the tournament. You look at this game on Saturday though against Oregon State. This is also a must-win. You're talking about those Arizona games that they have to win. They have to win this Oregon State game. If they are going to get a first round by in the Pac-12 tournament, they need to beat the teams that they are supposed to beat. Yeah, The games against the Oregons of the world and the Arizonas of the world and possibly even the Utahs of the world, you'll, you'll take it if they lose. But uh, if they want to get that first round by in the Pac-12 tournament, they have to beat the teams that they're supposed to beat. And this Oregon State team is um, dreadful. This this next to Cal is one of the worst teams in the conference this year. And I'm not going to go as far as the nation because I admittedly don't look at all of the other teams across the NCAA as it stands right now. But this Oregon State team is bad. Like, it would be miserable from a outlook perspective if ASU were not able to just put this team into the dirt when they face them on Saturday. Yeah, and they would go to 11 and 9 on the season and 5 and 4 in the Pac-12. I think you can pretty much kiss the tournament goodbye at that at that point. Unless 100%. again, unless again they pull an Oregon State from the COVID year and <laughs> run through the tournament and get there because uh, that happened with Oregon State a few years back. Um are we are we we're done with basketball, right? Like we can we can move on. A little, I, I we're would, gonna come back to women's I would, basketball. I wish they had played better tonight. That's yes, it. um, it's a good way to end it, Mitch. Um, <laughs> so what happened in Arizona it, down in Tucson, Jesse? They they fired their AD. It's kind of shocking. Yeah, they're, but it like does that go along with the whole financial stuff? Like correct. Yes. Okay. So they're moving on from their athletic director. Um, Dave Hickey, he's going to have his last day on February the 2nd, um, and the, re- the reporting coming out about this, I think, is what makes it far more shocking, is, and the it's more so the quotes that Brett McMurphy with Action Network was able to pull up out of this, right? Correct. Yes. He said, Arizona AD, and sorry for the pause. That You're I was, good. I was trying to pull up his tweet, and it was taking for a very long time. Uh, Arizona AD Dave Hickey was fired for, quote, financial and operational mismanagement resulting in an athletic department financial, uh, quote, unquote, disaster, loss of major donors, and mishandling of former coach Jed Fish's contract, end quote. Woo. That's a lot. Um, and and that's a strong statement from that school. Yeah, I mean, it, it just sounds like their financial problems have to do with this old administration and maybe even losing Jed Fish. 
So, I, I mean, I don't know if this is – this is just – it's a, it's a tough situation for those down in Tucson, but it's also kind of – I don't know if it's a – I don't want to say it's a good thing for Arizona State, but it's just – it, it it shows that I guess I guess my my takeaway is that ASU has to get this next athletic director right. They moving have to into, get it before U of A gets their next one too. Yes, and moving into this new era of college sports that we are in, you want to have somebody that can manage it. And from you know what I've been reading, that was not the case. So with um, U of A, so. That's really my takeaway from the situation. Mitch, your thoughts? I know that uh, Kevin put out a piece recently just highlighting individuals that could be considered as next ADs because both of these universities in the state of Arizona are looking for one. And I'm just going to read the names. We don't know much about these individuals, of course, but Mac Rhodes, who is currently with Baylor, he's their VP and director of intercollegiate athletics. So if you get... (laughs) <laughs> a Big 12 rivals team to now come to one of the Big 12 schools. Pat Chun, who's with Washington State, the director of athletics, of course, had a lot of things to say as the Pac-12 was starting to dissolve. Would he want an opportunity to get out of what is now the basically sunk Pac-12 conference? Brian White, who's with uh, FAU and he's the VP and director of athletics. And I know another one that get, got tossed around very early on and when Ray uh, stepped down was Rocky Harris, but he's very deeply involved with um, Special Olympics right now and helping them as they approach the summer games that you're coming up this summer. Is he going to leave that opportunity to them come to Arizona State? I know there's connections there. I know he's got wealth of experience. It's just kind of a different realm for him if he goes that way. A name that I would like ASU to kick the tires on, and I know... This guy, he went to this school and is an alum. Mark Harlan from uh, from Utah. I th- at least kick the tires on it. See if you can pull him away from Utah. He's mm. done a fantastic job at that school, not only with football, but with men's and women's basketball and other sports. At least kick the tires on him. Yeah, I mean, it would be... A much nicer climate to live in. That's something that you could you could say. But like, I mean, Utah's got that NIL backing that I don't think ASU has quite yet. So I, I don't know if you would leave there. But it is a much bigger market and a bigger you know university to be ahead of a, a, an athletic director at. I mean, maybe you know, your salary would go up in that instance. But there's a lot more repair to be done at ASU than there is to be done at Utah. They're kind of in a really good spot. One of the best atmospheres in college football. They're moving into a conference that they can probably dominate. So I think that one would be tough. Um, and I, I, said, just, I, I said the wrong thing, by the way. He went to U of A, and that's why it might be tough to get him to come here. Um, so yeah, that, and again, I don't know. I don't know. It worked don't out know. for Antonio Pierce when he was with Arizona <laughs> yeah, State. No. And again, that's another reason why I just I don't really want to see it. And um, I will add real quick that um, this just came out about an hour and a half ago uh, that the interim CFO, John Arnold, uh, at U of A told the Arizona Board of Regents that thirty five million of the one hundred and forty million fiscal gap at U of A last year came from the athletic program. So it's mm. not that much of the gap, but it's still $35 million. It's not great. Um, and then this is the quote from him. Uh, Quote, the national model around college athletics has changed over the last five years. As we modernize the University of Arizona Athletic Department, I think there, there's going to have to be a broad community discussion about what we what to what do we want out of the University of Arizona's athletics? What do we want out of that experience? What products do we want to provide? And then be realistic about what are the costs to provide those products. We're going to make that as cost effective as possible. We're going to talk about revenue generation, but we're also going to have to be realistic about what is the cost of having a full blown athletic department or whatever athletic department we decide moving forward, end quote. So that kind of sounds like to me that U of A is going to cut some sports. Ooh. That would be interesting. Yeah. Um, speaking of U of A, they hired an old friend of ours. Hmm. Danny which, which old friend? Oh, that one. Mm-hmm. He's a good old friend, though. Yeah. Yeah, but he was uh, very 
anti U of A during his tenure here at ASU. So well, I can't wait to see what he's asked about ASU when yeah, he gets introduced. Yeah, so it'll be a very, very interesting um, to see him down in Tucson. He's going to be their special teams coordinator, linebackers coach. Again, he was the head coach at New Mexico um, after his role at ASU. Um, I didn't think he would go back to, to being uh, anything but a coordinator, so it makes sense that he's the special teams coordinator down there in Tucson. It's just a very, very, very interesting choice for him to be at U of A now, given just how much he bought into the rivalry from an ASU perspective during his time here at uh, Arizona State. Uh, you look at the other hires. They hired former uh Syracuse head coach Dino Babers as their offensive coordinator and QB's coach. It's an interesting hire. Um, kind of uh, okay as a head coach. Yeah, but it, it, when you look at Syracuse, what they were able to do is they were able to beat the teams that they were supposed to beat and then never win that big game. Like They'd start the season 5-0 and and you're like, oh, wow. And then I think that they lost like five straight this year and almost didn't make a bowl game. Mm. Um, and Dino was fired before the bowl game. So uh, my dad went to Syracuse, and from what I understand, uh, what people think about Dino from there, they liked him a lot. So it'll be interesting to see yeah, how he's perceived at U of A. But um, what I watched when I watched a Syracuse offense was a team that didn't really know its identity. One year it could be running up the gut a lot. One year it could be trying to throw it down the field a lot. So And they let Tommy DeVito walk to Illinois and didn't really – give him that opportunity that he probably should have been given at Syracuse. Man, I didn't think I would hear that name today, I mean, to be he's honest. Been, he's a very good uh, backup, at least in the NFL, so uh, you probably he's, would... He he's probably all been, vibes. I love yeah, it, though. he probably would have been pretty good as a starter at Syracuse if you know they had given him more of an opportunity there and not had him go succeed at Illinois. I think there's a difference, though, in this scenario, and I understand the... It's a U of A podcast. We're a little, we're we're talking. <laughs> well, no, this is this is important though because we haven't touched on this yet. Because when we last potted, we were under the assumption that there might be some change as far as U of A's offense is concerned because we did not know what the fates of Noah Fafita and Tetsarol McMillan would be. Well, they're staying, which kind of changes the outlook of how U of A is going to be when they enter this Big Twelve conference next year. And it now starts to take a little bit of the shine off of ASU, who's, granted, they've got the consistency and the continuity that Kenny Dillingham wants, but for Arizona to retain both Fafita and McMillan is otherworldly, especially given how Jed Fish just kind of lucked into having both of them be successful for the offense. And Fish left with essentially his entire coaching staff, and only, to my knowledge, only one player, Jonah Coleman, followed. Was there anybody else significant that I forgot about? Not off the top of my head. Um, and to, to to respond to your, is this a U of A podcast, Jeremy? No, it is not. It is an ASU podcast. But all of this very much impacts ASU, just given the fact that this is their biggest rival. They're going into a new conference together where it's going to be um, – probably a little bit less competitive and give each side a little bit more of a chance, you know, with no Oregon and USC and Washington and UCLA and even in Oregon State or Wazoo to worry about. Um, so I think that it's just very interesting. And I, you know, I don't know if this coaching staff here, here's the thing. I don't know if this coaching staff is better than, I think it's a downgrade coaching staff from the Jed Fish coaching staff overall. Like no, no offense to Dwayne Aquina, who's the new DC at U of A. He's been there before, but like he was a defensive coach and then he was an offensive coordinator, which d doesn't really make sense that now he's a defensive coordinator. I guess he's a defensive. So guy he's the Matt start. Patricia of college football. Yeah, exactly. So like I don't really know what they're doing on defense necessarily. So you know, I I still think this is a good thing for ASU overall. This whole Jed Fish departure and. You know, bringing in these assistant coaches that not necessarily have had, like, I think Danny Gonzalez would have probably been a better choice at defensive coordinator. His 3 3 5 scheme, I loved at ASU. So, soft sound. Maybe him, you know, maybe him at special teams coordinator is not the move. So, 
it's just a kind of a confusing staff to me that seems like a lot of reject coaches, <laughs> not going to lie. So I think it's pretty good for ASU. You look at the rest of the coaching staff, you named another one in Akina, who's the new DC, and then um, former DB's coach and associate head coach um, and OC under uh Dick Tom, he was the former DC. A lot of these guys have Dick those Tommy Dick Tommy ties, yeah, because yeah. they were all on staff with yes, Tommy at the same and, time. And uh, Bobby Wade, I believe, played. Who was the a- other ASU assistant that they hired? He played for U of A. He was a wide receiver for go. them, I think. Yeah, yeah. So like I, that one, I, that one doesn't bother me at all because he obviously played there. I think it's weird to coach your rival, Jesse. Tell me what happened with women's basketball the other day. They, they finally won a conference game. Awesome win, too. They beat, yes, they beat a good Washington team. A, a, at the time, they were top 50 net. Jalen Brown, 34 points. She's been playing excellent basketball. Um, did you interview her the other and, day? And I, I did, yep. And so, yeah, I mean, if we want to. What? Yeah, if we Wait, just want to. That's going to be right here. Yeah, we just want <laughs> right to do that. Right now. <laughs> Jeremy, right now. I'm Jesse Morrison, alongside Jalen Brown, ASU guard, coming off of a huge performance in their win against Washington. Just first off, Jalen, how did it feel to get that first conference win? It was amazing, honestly. I feel like we put the work in, and when you finally get the results that you want, you know, it's going to be exciting. So just looking forward to more conference wins for sure. And your performances have been really ticking up recently just with the 34 against Washington and uh, the 30 plus a few weeks ago just um, what what do you think has led to the success that you've had just hard work honestly I'm in the gym every day uh, I make sure that I'm doing what I need to be doing at all times so just looking out you know making sure that I understand when to score and knowing how to score and just getting help from my teammates whether that it is setting a screen or you know just hitting my open shots so it's exciting and you know I know it's only nine wins this year but it's more than last season just just what does it feel like to you know improve from that last year I know that you weren't on the team but just how does it feel to come in here and you know already be improving upon last season it's amazing I mean coach Adir she's one of the best coaches I've ever played for and I just feel like now is the opportunity for people to see that what she's doing is really working and we're improving in every aspect so when we get some you know we continue to get new players and you know we just continue to do what we need to do it'll be amazing when it's well put together for sure and you mentioned how much you like playing for coach um just what was was that kind of the big reason why you came to asu from louisville just kind of take me through that process just the opportunity, yes, playing for Coach Adir meant a lot to me because of who she is as a person. I know she genuinely cares, and this is a program that has lots of love and support. And that's just what I wanted to come play for, a program that had a lot of support and, and understood their players. And I think that's exactly what she gave gave me coming here. All right, playing Stanford this week, one of the you know top programs in the country. Just um, I know you, you've you've played uh, against teams like that before, but just just what do you expect out of that game? I just expect everybody to give their all. I mean, every team is going to give you their best punch, and you just got to respond to it, you know. So I'm just looking forward to it, excited. I'm going to go out and do it exactly what I do. So it's going to be fun and definitely a new opportunity. And what do you think it will take to to beat Stanford? It's going to take everybody. It's going to take all of us. Uh, It's going to take, you know, just great effort and great intensity. Um, But I think that our team will bring that on Friday. (laughs) On Friday, I definitely think we'll bring that. And then um, just overall, you've got a few more years of eligibility here. Um, Just kind of what are your goals uh, at ASU, you know, for the next couple of seasons, either personally or um, as a team? Just to win. I, I'm the type of player, I don't ever really set goals for myself. That's why when I break them, I'm like, whoa, that's amazing. But, um, yeah, to definitely just win, do whatever my team needs me to do and be the player that my coaches need me to be. And as far as this season's goals go, just, you know, what do you expect down the the home stretch of this season? And how do you, do you think you guys can build off of that uh, game against Washington? 
we're just going to take the same energy that we had from that Washington game, bottle it up, and we're going to continue to go on with the rest of our season. So we're going to try to win almost every – the last couple of games that we have. Um, and it is early. It's only January, so we have a lot of room to grow and a lot of room to improve. And your nickname is Ice. You spoke about this in the media availability just now, but um, – just how did you get the nickname and um, yeah could you just go into the backstory of that well in the fifth grade I was learning to play basketball and I finger rolled the ball off my finger accidentally um, my coach he called me ice and I was like who is that and he was like the ice man George Gar- George Gerving um, so yeah that's how I got the nickname ice long slinky just like him <laughs> and I do finger roll the ball now so it is it is you know it helps have you gone back and watched highlights of the ice man yeah I feel like when you're being told you play like such a great, you you have to go back and look. So I definitely went and checked out some of his clips. And uh, last question about um, just the game on Friday um, with Coach Vanderveer passing Coach K for the most all-time NCAA basketball wins. Just what is it going to be like to play against such a coach, you know, with such a prestigious resume? It's going to be just really cool. I don't want to say we're going to be starstruck because we still have to win. We still got to kick them. But I will say that what she's done is amazing and just being in the same space, the same opportunity, you know, um, to play against a coach like that is just going to be amazing for me. So I'm excited. Thanks so much. Thanks to Jalen Brown for taking the time to talk to Jesse the other day. We really appreciate it. Great game against Washington and hope for the best for her and the team as they continue in Pac-12 play. Stanford this weekend, big, Ooh. big game for them. That's going to be tough. Um, but uh, Brick was out the other day, so we'll see if she plays Yeah, um, against ASU this weekend. Yep. Um, now, hockey. Not the best uh, weekend, Mitch. They played against Augustana. They split. Now they moved down to number eight, or still at number 18 in the country. Um, they have the weekend off. Oof. I think that's a much Thank needed goodness. weekend off as they continue uh, into the season. It's a long season in college hockey, so whenever you can get some time off, especially in college hockey, I think it's uh, appreciated for these I mean, guys. I wonder if this is the point of the season where it's kind of... We've played a lot of games, right? And ASU was very successful so far this season. Still have been very successful. But then getting swept by Cornell at home and then splitting on the road against Augustana, it kind of sets them back into the low part of it. But I, generally speaking, I have trust in Greg Powers. He's still done great work to keep this unit motivated. And to your point about having the weekend off, huge. Get the rest, you know? Sempton Felter can't be between the pipes all the freaking time you know like the dude needs some rest you know to be one of the best goalies in college right now yeah i mean it's it's encouraging that they are still um number 18 in the country in the top 20 um but yeah they've got again they've got to kind of start rattling off wins just like the men's basketball team does and uh mitch that those games were at mullet arena the August so you need you yes. need to, you needed to correct him on that. Well, I, I just no, want, no, no, I it's important. Our, uh, I just want to make sure we're, we're it's being important. accurate. You know, I it's feel important. like they've had a lot of home games this year. Yeah, all they do is play at home. That's good. I would want to play at that home. Are you kidding me? Yeah, I'd want to play there. It's good. No, better um, than uh, you know Oceanside. Yeah, we don't talk about the Oceanside. Yes, it was, and then they're home again, and then they're home again, and then they're finally on the road. Okay, they're, really they're quick. Not on the road until February twenty third. Really quick. Anyone else accidentally hit their head on the giant bar going yes, through the Yes, everybody meet? has. Okay. Just making sure. That's it. Yeah. That's yep. all I got. Oceanside. Um, shout out. Is it even... Have they not, no, they it's still around. Down, right? uh, shout out to our old professor, Mark Rita. Rest in peace. He uh, would always text us before the game at Oceanside and say, in parentheses, watch your head. <laughs> and then that, another fine, Jesse, Come as on, I'm memorializing man. our old professor. Just awful. I, that yeah. may be a two, $2 fine. Yeah, you know, Mark would be disappointed with me as well for that. That's so. just like such an unprofessional broadcaster it right there. It really is. <laughs> yeah, yep. Mark would be extremely... <laughs> do it for uh, the stream, man. <laughs> yeah, you would be extremely upset with me for that uh, right there. So, yeah, you know. Anyway, that's going to do it for this edition of State of the Sun Devils. Thank you so much for listening. Unfortunate loss for ASU today, 80-61 to 61 in Oregon. They have a big one at Oregon State this weekend to try and pull out a, sw- uh, a split against these Oregon schools. 
Um, if thank you again to Jalen Brown for joining us, she uh, she she was very gracious with her time with Jesse, and uh, hopefully they you know pull off the upset against Stanford this weekend as well. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at AZ Sports Devils. It's the same on Instagram. Uh, Facebook and Threads. We have Threads. Yeah, we do have Threads. So if you want to follow us on there, people have started following us on there. I saw today. Uh, I got some notifications, so that's good. It's we should probably start threading. Again, I'm we should start threading. Threading? Threading? Threading. What is it? Threading. Is it one of those two? Threading. Anyway, you can watch us on YouTube. We do almost every podcast on YouTube. Uh, the away. Arizona Sports YouTube channel. You can find us there or wherever you get your podcasts. Um, you can also, if you download the Arizona Sports app, you just click on the video tab. It'll be there as well. We make it very easy for you to find our podcast. And if you want to find our podcast, it's there. I promise. It will be there. Jesse, right? Correct. Yeah, you're going to put it there. Okay. Um, I'm not going to put it there. You'll No, whatever. Um, if you want to find uh, whatever we do on ArizonaSports.com, we write a lot of articles. Not me. I wouldn't write. Jesse does. Uh, Alex Weiner does a great job covering uh, ASU basketball, men's basketball as well. Uh, so follow them over there. Thank you so much for listening and watching if you are. I appreciate it. Uh, and we will talk to you this weekend or next week. One of the two.